So just so we're clear. <laughs> okay. We began our new sermon series last week by considering the idea that God makes demands of us. And demands, uh, these demands we might refer to as a calling. Now, a calling is more than just a request. It's an inflection point, you know, it's a point of change in our lives. It comes as a means of altering our lives to fulfill a purpose that God has for us in relation to the world. Now, there are many callings referred to in Scripture. Last week, we looked at the calling of Jesus to a prophetic ministry. Now, this week, we're going to focus on a different sort of calling altogether, and it's the way that God calls specifically to children. Now, you heard the story just now of how God called to Samuel as a boy under the tutelage of Eli, a prophet of God. Now, Samuel would grow to become one of the most influential prophets in all ancient Israel. This guy was a virtual kingmaker. He was the man who would lead the tribes of ancient Israel to unite under one banner, uh, under a banner of a God-appointed king. But he did everything that he could to dissuade them from that because he understood that um, a lot came with a kingship. But before all of that, we saw the way that God called to him in the night. And Eli taught him how to listen for God and also how to respond. Now, the reason I love this story, and I wanted you to hear it again, is because it reminds us that God talks to everybody even children. Some people believe that children lack the maturity to understand God's call. But today's gospel lesson kind of turns that notion on its head. Jesus directs us to consider that the only one who humbles themselves like a child can be greatest in the kingdom of heaven. In fact, when Jesus rebuked the disciples who tried to turn little children away from the master, he said, let the children come to me and rebuke them not, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of heaven belongs. Siblings in Christ, I think we forget about that in church. You know, church can be an incredibly hostile environment for children. In traditional worship formats, in different ways of doing church, the underlying assumption about children is that they should meet a certain standard of behavior, uh, a standard meant to help them understand the need to be respectful in church. You undoubtedly grew up hearing things like that. And it's something that we practice with our children, my wife and I. While well-meaning, I've often butted heads with folks who espouse this notion by reminding them that, frankly, not even the most mature disciples of Christ seem to be able to cultivate the humility necessary to remain respectful in church, much less outside the bounds of the church. So age isn't really what we're talking about here, is it? After all, we're all on the same path of sanctification, that is, learning how to become more perfect in love with our neighbors and with God. And age does not make that any easier. I mean, it may actually complicate it a bit. And frankly, I think Christ knew this. When you consider children, well, a child follows their mom or their dad or their guardian. They don't really wish evil on people, and they really couldn't care less about money. That sort of thing comes later. There's no hatred in the heart of a child, you know? They believe what they're told, unless they have a reason to fear or question their teacher. And they're humble, and not in a way that is practiced. It's second nature to them. 
Grown people don't behave like that. <laughs> I mean, think about it. We're skeptical. We can be cynical. We backbite. We're obsessed with ac accumulating wealth and comfort. And sometimes we dehumanize others for our self-advantage. And we anger much too easily. Sometimes we even believe the world owes us something. Kids aren't like that. Now, if you consider the ways that we shepherd children in churches, you find that children are segregated from every other believer. And we have reasons for doing that, of course. They're usually related to justifications that are rooted in human development. But rare is the church with a discipleship system that accommodates children in worship. Most will relegate children and their disruptions to more age-appropriate programming, like Sunday school, the children's message, cry rooms. I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say that children's programming is critical in church because it gives mom and dad a break from the kids so they can focus on the service. Well, who are the kids supposed to learn from anyway about God? Now, the segregation of children in our discipleship systems is, in my opinion, very short-sighted. It robs us of the opportunity to see God at work. Haven't you ever seen a kid you know or a kid you've raised do something that just astounds you? What an awful life it would be to miss out on those little events. It also cheats our children of courage as they're programmed to believe that they are somehow not whole or ready for faith. That faith is ultimately uh, an adult concern. Nothing could be further from the truth. Scripture makes that very clear. And I think it's why Jesus was so adamant about discipling children, about essentially throwing the doors wide for them. Now, at my last church, if you can believe it, I don't know if you've ever been to Grace United Methodist Church, I once preached a sermon about a kid's show, Paw Patrol. Oh, saints, it was a revolution. Oh, my God. My goal was to teach my congregation that children had a lot to teach us, adults, about the nature of courage. Kids have a natural desire to test boundaries. I think we all know that. That's how they learn, and they deconstruct things, you know? That's how they figure out their limitations. But that process is ongoing, which, you know, to a parent trying to keep their kids safe, that's it's frustrating, to say the least. I mean, think about it. Parents will look at safety uh, like they would a photograph, you know, unchanging, fixed, ever-present. This is the way it's done. And kids don't think that way. They don't develop that way. Change is a constant companion for them. They, they can't help it. They're always growing. So, too, their definition and redefinition of their abilities. Now, parents feel a deep sense of longing when they look at pictures of their kids when they were younger. We call that nostalgia. Oh, look at how far they've come. But kids are always asking, hey, what's next? What's next? Oh, that's an interesting picture. What's next? Losing that what's next perspective is the first step toward a church losing its way because it's rooted in the assumption that faith is a stable unchanging thing not so not at all faith is a matter of examination and re-examination because it's tested every single day by new challenges and so I wonder, did Jesus perhaps think that the adult mind was simply ill-equipped for such testing? 
Think about it. A wall will break when sufficient stress is placed upon it. A photograph only conveys information about a very specific point in time. It doesn't tell the whole story. Kids are not like walls, you know? They're not rigid like that. They're kind of more like water. They're fluid. And so I think we have much we can learn from their example as Christians. Now, as a pastor, it's my job to ensure that churches that I lead can maintain a discipleship system. I mentioned that before. And in case you don't, don't know what that is, it's really just a way of shepherding all the Christian disciples inside of a church from birth to death. And there are many ways to shepherd children, of course, many models, um, but n- none of them can work without one basic assumption, and that is that children are welcome in church. I'm sure you've been to churches where children did not feel welcome. For many churches, as they find themselves in a post-COVID environment, everything starts with the culture of a church. And many churches found themselves struggling to restart their children's programming as they engaged in the reopening process because they had no choice but to change how children's ministry was being done. One of the most startling revelations of this process is how hesitant modern parents are with entrusting their children to our care, especially if they've just joined us. Here's an example. The church nursery was a mainstay of children's programming in a church. But these days, many parents choose to keep their children, even infants, with them in service. They they just don't trust the system, they're not sure. And and there's a lot of fear, especially for a new parent. My wife and I struggled with this during uh, one of the rare times we were able to get some time away from our congregations. I remember this family vacation to Atlanta when Abe, my oldest, was two. Um, You know, LJ had not yet been born. Uh, And uh, we wanted to go to church. We didn't know if we wanted to go to morning church, but we found Uh, a young adult ministry there in Atlanta at a Methodist church that had an evening Sunday service. And we're like, yeah, we'll check it out. And so we got there and we took our seats in a a sort of social hall and uh, a church worker came by and they were like, hey, did you know we have a nursery? Uh, Would you like your son to go to nursery? And um, we didn't know what to do. We kind of looked at each other like, This is like a new place, we're a little afraid, we're new parents, is this okay? Um, And we ultimately decided to do it. But you know what? I couldn't focus on the service. I couldn't appreciate it. Yeah, I was just too worried, just too worried. Abe was fine, by the way, afterward. He was just like, I wanna stay here, you know? Yeah, really nice ministry. These days, we worry constantly that Abe will not get a fair shake in a church because of his autism. You know, I spoke about that last week with you. And the lack of training that church workers get when it comes to dealing with children with special needs. Now, we've all heard about the growing prevalence of autism in our society. This simply underscores the need for change in church culture lest we lose a a generation of future disciples simply because we couldn't become more accommodating. And generational differences, of course, they play a role in how a church shows hospitality toward children. As I said before, there are people who still believe that children should be seen and not heard in church. So church, there are very few hills that I wish to die on. I want to assure you that so long as I am pastor of this church, children will always be free to be themselves in the sanctuary I care for at minimum. And their parents should never worry about my judgment. 
I would hope that you would be similarly accommodating. I would rather hear the holy cacophony of children filling this space with their chatter and their noise than silence, because the sound of children is the sound of life, and a church devoid of that sound is a dead church. Jesus makes it very clear in our morning gospel reading about how he feels about people that cause children to stumble in faith. Let me read that part again. If any of you cause one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for you if a great millstone were fastened around your neck and you were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of things that cause sin. Such things are bound to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. And then verse 10, take care that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you in heaven, their angels continually see the face of of my Father in heaven. That last bit is important because in ancient Hebrew tradition it was said that to see the face of God was to know death. So it's just kind of stressing the point there. I pray that when the time comes for you individually to show hospitality to a child in church, you'll recall those words of Jesus and welcome them with open arms just so we're clear. Amen.